in different roles, right? so technical innovations in the bio domain, business development, uh, community building, you name it. So I'm a bit of a generalist. Don't hesitate to ask me strange questions, basically. Okay, so as, as I said, I'm based in Brussels. Uh, this is a picture of our main square. Last year, Brussels declared climate emergency uh, in a move to kind of stress the importance of the challenges we're facing and to also tell the people that, hey, um, we need to change. And if you have ideas or initiatives, we are also here to support you. So I think that shows how, how, how much of a relevant, relevant theme this is, and cities really want to play uh, a central role in this. I've talked about that also briefly in the research gathering before the, the role of cities. In change. Without further ado, the program of, um, of today, I will first give you a short introduction, not too technical. If you have any questions, please, uh, please do ask. Uh, in the chat during the presentation, and there will also be a QA um, after. Um, then, some world class cases, things that I've uh, found along my journey that I'm, yeah, that I kind of admire, I guess, and that I also try to interpret and see okay, what are they doing well, and, and what does that mean for, uh, for new solutions that we might want to build. build. Uh, and I've divided it in two parts basically the ones that I, that I see that are really going today and are, are finding some traction. And then the second one is uh, how, how might it look like in the future, in 2050, because we tend to put 2050 as a date when we look at the future, or God, God knows why. <laughs> okay, and the third part is a breakout session. So you'll get to talk with each other a bit uh, about circular economy in your setting, and, and uh, I will give you some, some framework to do that. Um, Basically, the, the point of this presentation will be will be your frame uh, will be your framework, but I won't uh, I won't spoil that yet. We'll start with um, with the introduction and we'll start with a quiz. So, Peter David, if you can run uh, the poll, please. And um, so, thank you. So, Winnie has prepared a short poll with four questions, and I know if some of you are entering from a browser, and not the app, then you cannot participate in the survey. So I'm sorry, but we will just take the four questions. I hope uh, some of you are joining with the app, downloaded app. So let's try to see uh, the four questions that we need. Here we go with the first one. How many barrels of oil? Oh, you may be, yeah. Winnie, you go ahead and explain the questions maybe. Yes. So the first question, how many barrels of oil do we use globally every day? Barrels is a bit of a strange measure, I think that day-to-day -day people don't really use, but that's how it's done in the industry. So I can vote as well. Let's go for 970. Yes. <laughs> and a barrel is 159 liters, I think. Uh -huh. That's the measure, 159 liters for one barrel. Oh. Yes. <laughs> it's a lot of oil. So, yes. <laughs> and now we... We, we get to see the results, to, Peter David? No, we st yeah, we still have, we have 26 people out of 37 who have voted right now. Uh, and let's see, it looks like only 27 can vote maybe. So I will close the poll now and we'll see the results. Yes. Okay. Can you see the results also, Winnie? I cannot, but I do have the answer. Okay, and this, let me tell you that, okay. But uh, the, the score was actually 50% uh, 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 set 9.7 million barrels per day, 42% set 97 million, and 8% sent 970,000 barrels. Okay. So that's not that bad of a result then. <laughs> okay. People are consuming oil by the barrel here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question. Okay, let's see. Uh, question two. Here we go. I'm going to go 20 years. How many barrels of oil do we have left? Yes. So that's an interesting metric to see, uh, well, to put a number on the, the, that thing that we always hear, resources are finite. So how finite are they? Mm -hmm. uh, a side note is that, of course, there's always a new um, oil being discovered. Not that much anymore, but so, so it, 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 is, it is a phenomenon that this number can stay constant around 20 years for like a hundred years straight. But anyway, okay. that's not the 
point of this question. Okay, and now we have 26. It looks like 26 people can vote today. I apologize to the 12 who cannot, but let's see the results. So 46% said enough for about 20 years. 23% said enough for about 40 years. And that's the correct answer. Yes, okay. And 31% said enough for about 60 years. Okay. Okay. People are uh, pessimistic. It's, <laughs> it's okay, guys <laughs> and girls. We have about 40 years, but still. That's not, that's 2060, so we better be ready by then. Okay. The third one? Okay, let's see. You put it on the screen now. Here we go. How much food is thrown away globally each year? How much food is thrown away globally each year? <clears throat> uh, Puja talked about it in percentages. A third of all food is thrown away, but what is the exact, what well, exact, I mean, what is the number? Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking for. I'm going to go for the biggest one. Don't take my answers for, uh, I don't know if you, if you can actually see my, my voting. Don't take my No, we, can, we cannot see your voting, no, no. Okay. okay. Okay, this time we have 29 out of 41 people voting. That looks good. Let's see the, oh, 30 people, good. That's good, I think we can close now. Very good. So 60% are saying it's C and 33% saying B. Yeah, and 7% uh, saying A. Okay. 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 So we got it. So I also looked it up. This amount, so it's 1.3 billion tons of food. That's enough to feed the 800 million hungry people in this world, and it's worth 2.6 trillion dollars. <laughs> so that's insanity, right? That that is thrown away. Okay. Mm -hmm. The last question. Here we go. So the percentage of um, of waste recycled in the EU. Uh, to be clear, this is really recycling. So uh, not landfill, not burning, um, not uh, like alternative reuses, like uh, filling uh, highway uh, uh, foundations with waste. It's really recycling. Okay. Right now, 35% is taking a strong lead uh, and 50% is getting 14% of the votes. And I think we are just about there now. 30 people, any more who want to vote? 31, 32, that's good. Okay, I think we can close now. And 35% gets 75% of the votes. 50% uh, gets 22. And 85% gets only 3%. Okay. And the right answer is for the winners, basically. It's 35%. It's, uh, I'm not so sure what I, what I think about this number. It's not really high, it's not really low probably i guess among the better ones in class globally um but it's not so high either so um i i, I selected some questions of course to to kind of uh, sketch an image of, of waste or of circular economy and term, the two terms are obviously very well related and also to to kind of see that okay on the one hand we have this so on the left we have this finite resources we're digging holes we're taking stuff out of the earth and then we're putting them like on a pile at the end of their life and, and putting them somewhere away to, I don't know even what is the thinking behind it, but to disappear at some point, I don't know. Nothing really, nothing much happens to landfill basically. But it's fine, kind of strange to me that on the one hand, we're really kind of using up things that we only have a limited amount of, and then we're just throwing it on a pile somewhere. So it's a very strange model that we've been using so far. And that's what this presentation is about. What if we can make it more circular where you know, we can actually keep using what we're taking out of the ground or maybe not take anything out of the ground whatsoever and definitely get rid of those piles of waste that we've, uh, that we've created. So first, I want to start with kind of a more philosophical thing, if you will, um, consider, considering really what is waste. Is it, is it really waste or is it wasted? Because often we're talking about waste as if it's like this constant in our universe that waste is like, a class of materials that is there and that we should avoid but um, like in, def in trying to define waste I find it very hard to define it as a noun let's say like what is waste how would you describe some a piece of waste is it is it something smelly well cheese is smelly we still eat it is it something dirty well carrots are dirty when they come out of the ground we still eat those so I find it very hard to find like descriptions of waste as a as a as a material or as a noun, it, it really doesn't make any sense. So I, I'm, my, my point of view is really that waste is just a man-made invention that has no use. It's just something fictional. It's a story that we tell about a material. But in reality, 
it's it's not really um, yeah, it's not really a class of materials. It's just something. It's our opinion about the materials. So for me, waste is just our own failure to do something useful with the material. It's not a class of material itself. It's a verb. It's to waste, um, and that's why I prefer to call um, waste wasted resources, not waste. It doesn't make sense. We are wasting resources, so we should call these things wasted resources. And these resources are just waiting for a, for an application. Um, I challenge you to try it out, just to try and reply waste by wasted resources. Recently in Belgium, they changed the name of like waste parks to recycling parks. And that's already a huge mind shift as well, right? Like, let's just stop talking about uh, waste altogether. And that will actually make also kind of the mental foundation and the mental framework for uh, things like circular economy, I think. Uh, we'll come back to it, to, to it as a, also later in this presentation. So the circular economy actually kind of and a simple way tries to eliminate waste and close these 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 loops of how we use materials um, and and try to do this importantly by uh, changing the economy so you have the circular part which is more intuitive like reusing things and not wasting them but there's also the economy which means we need to transform the economy so things need to be economically viable um, part of the presentation will also stress this is the, the economic importance and the economic potential of uh, so as I said, we're not going to go too technical. This is like uh, something made by the by the Flemish government here in Belgium. It was one of the like people that said it at one point. But circular economy isn't it just this basically? And she sketched this on a piece of paper, and it really is. So in a linear economy, you get these huge holes in the ground and huge piles of waste at the end. Um, you just you know take make break. Let's say in the recycling economy you reuse a bit of, of the stuff. But in a truly circular economy, your resources don't become waste. They just keep rotating in the economy and they keep being useful. They keep adding value to consumers. And to if we go more technical, then you know you have all these terms for describing circular economy that are more theoretical and try to really go in depth about what it means and, and really try to map the, the, the flows of, of the system and the design principles. We won't really go into these. I just want to show them to, to maybe guide you on your way. It's, they really all take a different angle of the same thing. So if you, if you, if you want to choose one, it's, it comes down to preference, I guess, uh, or, your, or your background. Um, we will briefly go into the more technical part to just describe some strategies. So this is a visual by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I put the link below. So if you want to copy it and type it, you may be able to see the visual better on your uh, browser. Basically, we have, uh, I, I left out the left part for now because I want to focus on the technical part. So the technical cycle of materials, you can see that there's different parts in the chain, the production chain, that's the one in the, in the middle or on the left of this visual, if you will. We have the parts manufacturer, product manufacturer, service provider. These are the different chains in the supply chain, uh, this, the different links in the supply chain. And then from the user or from the collection after the user, there's different loops, let's say, that go back to the previous chains. That's, that's the circular part. So if the user just fixes their own stuff, that's called maintenance. If after collection, it goes to the service provider, it can also be maintenance. You know, the, the person selling you the fridge will fix the fridge and maybe sell it secondhand. Um, you can go back to the product manufacturer. They can reuse it. They can redistribute the product. You can go back to the parts manufacturer, which then is recycling, because you're taking a finished product that goes back to parts, usually how recycling works. If nothing of that happens, you can you can look down and then it goes to maybe burning, landfill, etc. That's the, the leakage also, or the, the products that are impossible to maintain or to recycle or at the end of life. That's kind of the drawback also of this technical cycle, is that there's really no way to fully close the circle any leakage, any, any product that is kind of left behind somewhere in a ditch by accident or not, it is lost, it can be recycled. So there is a very clear limit also to these uh, synthetic materials because this is the cycle of plastics, metals, stones, etc. cetera, um, that, that yeah, we can't fully rely on those because those are all finite and those are all not fully uh, reusable or recyclable. So these things come back into a hierarchy. Again, very, very simplified. Top is the most desirable strategy. 
to reduce, basically use less. That's kind of a counterintuitive thing. You, it has nothing to do with recycling, just use less stuff. Uh, and then you go down to reusing, repairing, recycling, recovering, or if no other option, disposing, which is the least desirable. This is not a full story. Um, a very, very important remark about circular economy and about materials is that the value of materials is very context dependent. So um, you, you should not just reuse anything for anything, let's say. Um, food is a good example of that. Food is a very, very valuable material, if you think about it really in, in materials. So it, it, is, it is mostly the, the, the application with the highest value because it's very intensive to make, but it also, I mean, it's a very basic need of people. So we have 800 million people uh, hungry, so why would we be turning food waste into biogas, for example? It's, it, it, it doesn't really make sense. In some cases it might, but it's to be avoided. And then burning in landfill. So I put dots because basically it really depends on the context and there's very gray areas in between. Burning in landfill, however, will be, will be quite, uh, quite low in the hierarchy. Um, the ones that are in the gray area are material applications, um, so composites from, from wasted resources, et cetera, um, building materials, et cetera. So these are more gray areas where you need to be critical. Um, so the left part of this visual is the biological cycle. Um, biological materials are, for example, food, cotton, etc. Um, those those follow a different. It's a bit more complex, and it comes down to how the different ways it can degrade back into nature, can find its way into, for example, the composting stations, or into nature itself, or can be turned into biogas. So. The two important questions to ask about the material is how renewable is it first? And the second is how easy is it to break down? To, to, show, to show a bit more about uh, how this plays into practice, I, I prepared a simple uh, table as well. So you have basically two, it's, very, it's, it's really very, very straightforward. Like two questions, you have the renewability. So either it is non-renewable or fully renewable in this table. It's simplified it. There's also gray areas. And then reusability, is it not re reusable or fully reusable? So if it's not renewable and not reusable, it's a finite resource and it will create a lot of waste. I think we all know the kind of fossil fuel based synthetic materials, plastics, etc. does go there. The resources are finite and we can't do that much with them or we can recycle them a bit, but it's like, you know, just a postponing of the inevitable that they will end up in land. So not good. Fully renewable, not reusable. So these are bioplastics, for example, that have infinite resources because you can just grow organic matter to make them, but they are not recyclable or they are not really easy to break down. So they still generate a lot of waste. So in a world like this, you know, is it better than the bottom one? I don't know, because you can make an infinite amount of stuff that will then become waste. So that seems like also a dangerous thing to play with. So also not great better i don't know and then we have uh, not renewable fully reusable so that's a finite resource but that doesn't create waste i'm not sure which ones of that exist but basically uh, you can just make a bit of it but you can reuse it then uh, indefinitely of course there's there will always be uh, leakage there will always be things ending up on the waste bin anyway so what we're really trying to go for is an economy where we have infinite resources and no waste. These are the these these are the ones of the bio domain, and that's why I believe in them so much because we can grow them indefinitely using simply the energy of the sun, um, and they don't create waste because they can enter the circle or the loop again by being composted by being created biologically. So some examples of those. Uh, I, I I mentioned them already. I think in the not renewable, fully reusable. There's some rare earth elements that can go there. However, like the ones used in, um, in electronics. However, uh, yeah, there's always losses. There's always smartphones laying around in shelves in your house that, that, that can, that's considered leakage because there's nothing useful happening with those, with those materials. So what we're trying to go for are biodegradable materials, basically. That's, that's the only future proof strategy that we really have. So for, for um, like a rule of thumb in applying circular economy, I've, I, I, I use four rules, four, four rules of thumb, if you will. 
Um, we'll go through them now and we'll also use them as a, as a bit of a framework for, uh, for the cases that I will present. The first one is that we don't or we never waste materials. So I already said when we talked about it, waste is a verb. Waste is not a class of, uh, class of materials. Uh, I, I looked it up. It, it says to waste is to use or expend carelessly, extravagantly or to no purpose. Uh, and I think that sums it up. So we should not do it carelessly. So we need to have an end of life strategy for materials. What happens with the product at the end of life? If you don't, that's, that's a mistake. Yeah, it's a mistake. In a circular economy, you need to think about who will do what and how with my product or material after it's used. If, if, it's, if your strategy is throw it on a pile and forget about it or try to forget about it, that's not a strategy. Extravagantly, so we only use what we need, also makes sense. Uh, that's the, 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 the top part of that pyramid that we saw, reduce our consumption. And uh, we focus on the essentials first. So those 800 million people that are hungry, that might be more important than kind of finding better ways to recycle our smartphone 15XL or whatever uh, it is. Okay, the second point. Um, we use business models that prevent wasting. So this is already a bit more uh, complex, if you will, and this also poses, points to the economic uh, side of the story, the circular economy. We use business models that make it harder to waste things. So one business model that is now very uh, widely used as a circular business model and promoted is the service model, so a product service model. It's already used widely in software where you don't buy a program anymore. You pay a yearly fee. It's called uh, SAAS, Software as a Service. So in circular economy, we're going a step further and we're doing products as a service. So how it works to reduce uh, wasting is uh, this uh, graphic. So products don't change owner anymore. The user doesn't become the owner of their product. Stays property of the manufacturer who, um, who rents it out, who, who provides it to you as a service and you pay a fee. So there is always, since there will be more people doing this, a competitive pressure to lower these fees because people will go to the one with the lower fee. So this means that the manufacturer needs to think about the design of their product. It needs to be long lasting because then they don't need to bring it back and forth to their atelier where they produce it so much. It needs to be recyclable because at the end of the life, you know, the company who can reuse their parts of their product will win from those who have to waste it, who just throw it. Um, and they need to be energy efficient because maybe the manufacturer you know, pays for the electricity and bills it to the user or the user pays the, the electricity themselves. But in any case, the products that use less energy, they will win because you know the, the, the manufacturer can promote that their product is energy efficient and thus uh, saves people money. So these are great because that means less environmental impact. You know, So that's how a service model basically induces people to be more circular or a companies, induces companies to be more circular. So this is the, 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 the dynamic why circular business models are, are important because the more people do this, the less, yeah, the less wasted the resources we, we might have. Of course, the story is more complex than this and there are many shades of doing this, but this is just so you get the basic dynamic. My third rule of thumb is that we strive for a positive social impact. So um, yeah, that, that kind of uh, explains itself. We'll, we'll, we'll see an example later uh, where both, it can be both where circular economy is a tool to help people to have social impact or that you use, um, that, that is done as a, as a consequence of using a circular uh, strategy, such as if you use less rare earth elements, you are also reducing the amount of modern slavery, mining those minerals, if you will. But we will, we will look at an example of the former uh, using circular economy to have a social impact. And in the fourth, is to collaborate and share knowledge. This is super, super important. So I've studied the, the circular economy ecosystem in Flanders for, uh, for a few years. And a very important outcome of that, or an insight of that was that collaboration is the key to everything because our current economy is so segmented uh, across the supply chain. There's a discrete step in each, um, in each life of the, of the product. Like you have people making the raw pellets for making the like more raw plastic pellets to make uh, a product. Then you have people making maybe the, 
the, the molds, the, the, the shell of the product, and then you have people assembling the product. And these are all different, different players. So everything is, is very segmented. And in order to be circular, it, 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 it's pretty much impossible for one player in that chain to just say, hey, I'm going to start renting my product, or I'm going to start using this other kind of biodegradable material instead of plastic. It just doesn't go. It's just impossible because you have no, no partners, your partners are not on board, etc. And this is just a very simple example. For more complex things, you really need to sit down with your, with your uh, supply chain to find solutions. Because also only then you can find how is the most logical way of dividing the costs and the benefit of, of this circular strategy. Because it is circular economy, right? And to change, there, there needs to be some financial incentive and not throwing things on a pile, but reusing them in, 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 at a very basic level, that's a financially interesting way forward. It's, the, the problem is just who gets to reap the benefits and who pays for it. So in order to figure that out, you just need to come together with your supply chain. Otherwise, you won't be able to reap those benefits. Uh, if you do it alone, then you're basically tossing a coin. Am I going to have to bear the cost or am I going to reap the benefit? You don't know because you don't know the solution yet. So you need to figure it out together. So you can just from the get-go say we're going to split the cost and the benefits across the supply chain. Okay. So we're going to go through some cases on each of those points where, uh, where I found uh, companies or people doing things well in each of those points. Um, I don't know if, uh, if there are any questions in the chat. Um, there are some. There are some. If you open the chat, yeah, there were some questions. So maybe you open the chat and yeah, it's a good point to, to take a couple of them now. <clears throat> um, see, Martin agrees with the wasted resources part. Thank you. Um, are you saying that collaboration and sharing knowledge is automatically sharing risks as well? Yes, for sure. Uh, as, I, as I said, um, if like at a basic level, circular economy will, it's highly likely to be financially beneficial. And it's just a matter of how it will be distributed. So if you come together and you already agree with like we're going to share the costs and the benefits, then that's definitely reducing your risks, your risk in, in innovation. Uh, oh, am I, am I when missing? Winnie, there was one earlier from Evan McEwen saying, when you uh, say recycling in Europe, do you mean sent to Malaysia to rot or is it really recycled? <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, I tried looking, I tried digging deeper into the numbers, but I didn't find what they really mean by recycling. Uh, I think probably yes. Because, uh, I mean, they're already honest enough at the, in the European Union to be on, like to not include uh, burning in their recycling because many, many, um, many statistics do. But I don't think they will be so honest to say, okay, uh, this does not include shipping it elsewhere because, yeah. I, I mean, since China closed the borders, of course, I see it here in Belgium too, that there are many companies and governments saying like, oh no, like we need, now we are stuck with our own waste and they are, relocalizing their supply chain. So we have a very um, major plastic manufacturers and processors that are really coming together now to, to, to work on relocalizing plastic recycling in Flanders uh, in Belgium. So I do think that step by step uh, it, will, it will be better because indeed yeah, now recycling is, is often the story of shipping it to a faraway country and, uh, and waste or wasted resources are just a commodity basically now too. In global uh, trade um, so yeah maybe, that, maybe I can say to the Japanese audience if they want to ask a question in Japanese just write and I can help translate so okay so go on yes that's okay when you can continue and then we can take them later on okay in the interest Great. of time yeah so on to the cases um, so this is also a, a, a bit of a bridge to the Forex uh, project where we have a lot of cases gathered online. So I'm also participating in that. You can find them uh, on the platform. Well, Peter David can probably tell you more about that at uh, an opportune moment, uh, where you'll find more in-depth analysis about these examples that I'm presenting. I think all of them are, are represented there that I'm mm -hmm. talking about today. Mm -hmm. So first example is a company that I used to work at. And they make or they grow black soldier flies. Like soldier flies, the larvae of this fly, they eat everything basically. And they are used to process organic waste, uh, such as food waste, but even manure. Companies called Circular Organics, they're a global company now. 
uh, with, with also uh, operations in South Africa, in Europe. These are the larvae or the pupae of the larvae, let's say. And these larvae, so they turn, they turn the organic waste when they eat it into a high protein animal feed, which is now very unsustainable animal feed. It's, uh, it's usually from, uh, from fishing, uh, from overfishing, also small, small fish that perform a very important ecosystem function. So they, they, they replace those with the, the larvae that are grown in a basically contained environments. So the, the, the environmental impact is quite low. Um, but they also turn them into uh, valuable biochemicals. So chitin is a, is a very, very interesting biopolymer for uh, anything from uh, coatings to, to construction even and, and beyond. It's really uh, a very high potential polymer. Protein, of course, for, for industry uh, applications and fatty acid. Uh, as I said, they can even turn manure into, into, into larvae and then into these, uh, these applications. Um, yeah, it used to smell where I work. <laughs> Let's put it like that. Um, the leftovers of those larvae can also be used as uh, soil improvements. So you're basically turning waste into new resources and waste as low as lowly valuable as, as manure. This is a short video. It's called Resortex. This is also one that I like a lot. Um, you should be able to see and hear. We are all getting better at recycling our old clothes, but the process requires a lot of manual work. Smart Stitch works as a regular thread. It keeps clothes together and details in place. But what's different about it is that this thread dissolves at a high temperature. As a result, zippers and buttons are easily removed with the help of heat, which simplifies recycling. When used for regular seams, the whole piece of clothing can also be taken apart so that the fabric can be used over and over in new ways, cutting the need to produce fabric from scratch. Stitch by stitch, this innovation brings new life to old garments. So this one is very cool, I think. Um, it's really this, this, this thing that you don't see coming, like a dissolvable thread that, is, that makes it much easier to recycle clothes, which is super labor intensive. And does Hi guys, my name is Adam and I'm here with Love Crafts. We're going to be looking at top 10 embroidery stitches in this video. Oh, we're and I'm going to learn embroidery today. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as I was saying, this is one of those very cool things that allow, for example, the question about shipping to Malaysia, this reduces that because now, you know, you can, you can recycle clothes using this thread in countries where labor is more expensive. This allows you to relocalize textile recycling. So on the one hand, this is already an impact in terms of resources, but it's also a social impact. Uh, so this is a very, very cool uh, project. We'll look at it uh, a bit later as well. So the second one, this is Rolls-Royce, um, a major manufacturer of engines of all sorts, um, also uh, airplane engines. Importantly, so they have already since 50 years, actually, Rolls-Royce power by the hour. So they charge you for an hour of flying instead of selling you the engine. And all the service inc is included in that. They've been doing it for 50 years and over half of their revenue came from services that included this one. So this is, uh, this is a, a very, very nice example of, um, of a circular business model that will reduce waste and increase uh, actually value for, for the whole uh, supply chain. This is an example of a consumer product. It's a Dutch company that rents out washing machines. So uh, it's for people who don't want to buy a machine for different reasons, because they can't, because they don't have the money, because they, they are only staying for a year. Um, and it's, it's very attractive. Now they're also renting out coughing machines, um, uh, drying machines, beds even, I think. So it's really, uh, it's really a success. Um, Related to that, and this is, I think, even more interesting, is a Papillon project. So uh, this is a project that um, alleviates energy poverty through renting out appliances. Energy poverty is when people live from paycheck to paycheck. So they basically have enough money for a month, but not more. They're really waiting for the day their paycheck arrives. Um, but their energy bill is like a disproportionate percentage of that monthly uh, payments that they have to do because they have machines that are old and outdated and they just consume three to five times more energy than an energy efficient machine. So, but they don't have money to buy a new thing because they don't have any money left. So essentially they're trapped in high energy bills. Um, so if you rent them a machine, and that's what the Papillon project did together with Bosch, for seven euros a month, they can rent a washing machine and they start saving money instantly. Um, so they are basically, it helps them be lifted out of poverty and it's better for the environment because they have a more sustainable 
uh, machine in terms of materials, but also they consume less energy. So this is a beautiful example of uh, a social impact, but it's also a beautiful example of a market fit um, because these people are ideal clients for this type of service. You know, you will, if you want to increase your revenue, let's say as a company, you're thinking about it in an evil way, you're not going to sell machines to these people. So you need to rent them out. So this is also just a better uh, economical strategy. I think. And the fourth one, uh, to collaborate and share knowledge. This is an example of a company that I worked uh, alongside, let's say, in Denmark. Um, it, they're called Gentre, which is, I think, loosely translates as re-tree. Um, they are reusing the construction uh, safety wood uh, of construction sites because often this is thrown. Um, they sort it. Uh, they saw it back to, to better lengths or whatever, standardized lengths, and then they reuse it. Uh, and there, they actually saw that it only really started working when they evolved the workers on the construction site because they performed the key function because those were the people who always like, ah, oh, this is a waste uh, thing and throw it in the waste container. But by, by involving them, they were able to show, no, this is, this is perfectly usable wood. They showed them the wood that was recycled. And then people started seeing like, okay, we should throw this maybe in the gantry container. And then this is a valuable material uh, at the end of the day to even reuse for next construction. So you need to collaborate with people also that are just on the field, you know, it's not just across the supply chain. Within your company, you, think you need to involve everybody that is working with the material. Okay, I do see that we're going over the 30 minutes that I had planned for this, but we'll go a bit quicker. We anyway have a buffer. So this is uh, a very interesting case about collaboration. This, is, this comes from a Facebook group where someone posted how to make a biodegradable canoe from a mushroom composite. It's something that I was heavily involved in. I, I, I helped uh, set up this Facebook group. But basically in this Facebook group, you have 15,000 people sharing information like this. Uh, it's basically innovators, weirdos also, artists, designers that are making things. And maybe, maybe it's useful, maybe it's not. Maybe it's valuable, maybe it's not. But you have this whole community of people doing bio, um, biomaterial innovation. And this is super valuable, you know, because it's through these kinds of interactions and inspirations and even sharing actual technical recipes that you can advance quicker. Uh, oppose that to R&D happening in some hidden lab in a big company or in a government uh, lab. There's no, there's no spark there, but here you have people working together. Um, I, I posted the links as well, and I guess we can share the presentation after. There's also the BioFab forum that I helped set up where you have also recipes for this kind of stuff. So this is also a form of collaboration and knowledge sharing. Of course, knowledge sharing, it always goes with important side marks, side remarks, as in you have to attribute people or you have to at least mention the source and you have to respect the way that they want it to be shared. Some people say you can use my knowledge, but any knowledge that you make with my knowledge, you have to share it openly again. Um, that's more technical about, about intellectual property, but be sure to check what is uh, the IP on openly shared knowledge because it's, uh, because it's still important. Okay, and then the last part before the, the breakout sessions, how does the future look? Of course, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball uh, to look at the future. Um, also, it, it will be a bit less in depth. It's just uh, a, a way to show you where I, the direction where I think it lies. Um, because and, and at the end, we don't really know. And, uh, you know, I will, I'm biased. I said, I said it from the beginning. I, I believe in the bio solutions. So uh, this will be mainly bio solutions. But we also need solutions for that pile of trash that we created. So these kinds of recycling initiatives are definitely valuable uh, as well. They're just not immediately in my own, uh, in my own field. So bias aside, um, the first example that I have is Algae Knit. It's a, a US company that makes seaweed, uh, textile from seaweed. Um, the seaweed they grow on, um, on, on water with a high nutrient density, so also potentially wastewater. Um, and these are the steps that they take to turn it into a textile. It's kind of funky looking, pink threads, uh, but they're fully degradable. So this is squarely into the infinite resource and completely uh, degradable water. And their products look pretty, pretty sleek <laughs> if you're into that kind of thing. So it's also uh, like consumer centered way of, okay, this can be either like a hippie sweater, but it can also be a cool shoe. So it's important to, um, to find good, good applications for these things, of course. 
The next one is Biomace, and they've been around also for like 10 years, but they're, they're steadily growing and steadily researching. They make bricks from bacteria. So no more burning at thousands of degrees uh, with, with, uh, with in, like uh, finite resources like sand that disrupt the uh, ocean ecosystems. They just calcify uh, bricks. It's done in a similar process as, for example, um, crustaceans in the sea. So, so these animals with shells, how they create their own shells, it's basically 3D printing from nature. That's how they do it as well. They, they calcify um, a solution of water into these bricks using uh, bacteria. So that's also pretty cool. And this, is, this shows a nice diversity of the kinds of products they can, uh, they can produce. There's even uh, healable concrete with bacteria like this. So that the bacteria stay in the concrete and they keep calcifying. So if there comes, it becomes a, like a crack in the material, they will fill up the crack with new calcium and they will basically heal the concrete in place. This is also a very cool uh, startup. They're called NotPla from Not Plastic, but also like a wink to uh, PLA, which is a bioplastic that is not very biodegradable. Um, and they basically make packaging disappear. It's a very bold claim. They're, they have developed these edible sacks of seaweed uh, polymer that hold liquids, uh, such as sauces, but also water. They did a very, uh, a very funny commercial with Glenlivet. So they put the whiskey, like high-end whiskey in these bags. Very, uh, a very funny video if you want to look that one up. But they have actual, like actual products. I mean, this is also an actual product, but it's, it's very, very niche. They also have more general products like uh, dry packaging and coating for delivery, for food service uh, packaging, um, all based on seaweed, all fully uh, biodegradable and high performing, high performance uh, material. Definitely something uh, worth checking out if you're uh, in that sort of an industry. This is a very cool one, I think, or a very also unexpected one for a service model. Um, there is these guys show that there's really no limit. So these are these are people from the Netherlands, from Rotterdam. They've been using coffee waste for years and years uh, to make mushrooms. So that was already circular. But then they saw, hey, these mushrooms are worth more than the cups of coffee from those coffee grounds. So what are these people doing? They're basically throwing away the most valuable part of the coffee bean. So they said, well, we're gonna start coffee as a service where the manufacturer of the bean stays owner of the bean. And you know, you can make your coffee with my bean, you can extract 3% out of the bean, but I stay the owner and then we're gonna do something more interesting with those, which is growing mushrooms on them because they're more valuable. So um, this is kind of the future, they're exploring this, but it could be that in more materials or more commodities even that service models will take more hold because it, it yeah it, it makes more sense now we're thinking of a, of a material it has this application like coffee and we see only like we're like tunnel view on this on this value made in this application but we forget that maybe the material is much more valuable you know there's infinite things we can do with it after afterwards so maybe uh, service models are really uh, the way to go for, for seemingly commodity materials as well and then uh, the last one, I think, is called solin. Um, it's basically, uh, that's what it said. It's a protein made from CO2. So they use a, a microorganism that basically captures CO2 from the atmosphere and turns it into protein. So this is skipping the whole cow. This is skipping the soybeans fed to that cow. This is skipping the bacteria, even for making uh, like a lab-grown meat or whatever. This is just going straight to the point. Uh, I don't know how good it will be or how healthy it will be, but it is very, very futuristic, let's say, in a way, if you can really turn CO2, which is also a wasted resource, if you will, which you've made too much of it, uh, and just turn it into uh, nutrition. This is an actual picture of the, of the protein. You can find on their website even like funny videos of the like scientists throwing dust protein in the air. Uh, anyway, they're a bit strange as well. Those were the cases. So now maybe via the chat, you can, you guys can, uh, and girls can say, what do you think? Oh, well, I spoiled it there. What do you think are the are the common um, successful aspects of these uh, of these cases? I'll be the driver. Yeah. yeah, let's see how I can go to the chat. Open the chat at the bottom. What do they have in common? Yes. Okay. They have multiple things in common. I can start. <laughs> Collaboration. Yeah, I guess. Yes, <laughs> probably they do. 
well, we'll go to the first, renewability. Yes, actually, there you go. That's the answer. Mm -hmm. So they are, they are in that fourth quadrant. They are all in the infinite resources, no waste quadrant. Because I do think that, yeah, they're, they're, I mean, what I'm also trying to say is they're biological. Um, but, it, but it's very hard for non-biological uh, things to end up in a fourth quadrant. At best, they will be in the, in the bottom right quadrant where they are maybe always reusable, but still uh, fine. But there is another one, uh, and we'll just continue since nobody has mentioned it. They add value for their clients. So I think the circular economy part, the economy part is, is very important not to, uh, not to lose track of because all these things they have found or they are looking for a very good market fit because if, if it doesn't add value, then nobody will take it up the solution. Then your circular solution is a circular solution. It's not, a, it's not something in the circular economy. Uh, it, it doesn't work in the real world badly you know it would be great if things were just going to work without the money part but that's not what reality is so i would like to go through some cases uh, and and um, and go through the value that they add and then i will give you an example that you can think about as well so prepare for prepare your fingers for typing so the first uh, case as an example is resortex what do they add as a value well they increase the affordability of recycling so for manufacturers suddenly recycling because it becomes affordable uh, so that's the money aspect. The second is that it also allows access to these new recycling markets. So a, a product manufacturer maybe is not only a manufacturer anymore because of these dissolvable threads. Suddenly it becomes super easy for them to disassemble the clothes in the country where they are active, maybe with high labor costs. And suddenly they can just have a complete new business in, um, in uh, repair or, or sharing or, or recycling. So because this thread also makes it easier to, to repair or to uh, or to share because the sharing part is the service part you know if your if your product is more optimized for for recycling afterwards you can have a better uh, a better fee if you rent out your clothing for example there's there's many companies doing this by the way if you want to know more about uh, service models and fashions i can also give you some examples the third one is for a more classic approach you can delabel easier because the labels can be attached to the solvable thread and you can remanufacture easier. So all that stock that you have lying around that is, un, that is not useful, that is prone to be wasted, you can just remanufacture it or delabel it or change it into something that will sell. So that's also an added value for these manufacturers. And then lastly, uh, there are many sustainable brands out there now who actually want to buy a recycled material, like a raw material for their, uh, for their clothing. So this allows a manufacturer also to meet that demand. They can put recycled materials on the market at more competitive prices because of this threat. So these are very hard values added in a very competitive industry that in a way have nothing to do with sustainability, but they do improve sustainability. So these are the kinds that are, that are strong. The example about the washing machines. So I have considered it. Why? Because I don't want to like I want peace of mind, you know, printers, washing machines, those are things people hate. They just need to work, but they never do. But if you rent them and the service is included, then you can be sure that the manufacturer will make it happen for you, that they will be, that they will work when you want it, basically. Flexibility, you can stop your contract when you want, you know, maybe I will move in a year, I don't know, but I don't want a washing machine to be there when I move. I just want the contract to end, they will pick it up, they will go. So for expats or students, this is a very, very valuable service because suddenly they are not, they don't have to deal with the logistics of their, of their, of their household uh, appliances. And then thirdly, for short term solutions, maybe your washing machine is broken. It can be uh, a cost efficient solution. So again, this has nothing really to do with the sustainability aspect, but they create the right incentives to be more sustainable as a result. And then lastly, this is also important. The new generation, I don't know how many there are listening here today, <laughs> probably not so many. Generation Z, uh, it keeps going, X, Y, Z, but now it's finished, I think. The alphabet has no more letters. <laughs> uh, they want more flexibility. Like, this is what they want, you know? They, I saw that, I, I put this picture of this moped because that's how Brussels got kind of invaded and there's all these, these young people zooming around on these things because they don't want to own mopeds. They just want to ride mopeds, you know? They want to be free but they also care about the environment. So if you want to cater to this new generation that will you know, gain purchasing power in the next years, you need these kinds of solutions. You need sustainability. You need these kinds of service models. 
it's just it's just coming and also transparency it's just going both as consumers and as employees so it's really not going uh, not going away so now the question what are the added values of uh, of rolls royce here you can also type it in the chat uh -huh. can i open the chat for those who yeah. hmm. what is the added business value <clears throat> okay hmm. Yeah, so pay only for what you need. Lower capital, lower capital, lower maintenance costs, indeed. I agree with all of those. Um, let's see what I wrote here. So, well, let's not forget that basically you're getting power also. <laughs> like the main, the, you're, you're getting what you're paying for, you're getting this certainty, cost efficiency, so that's the lower maintenance cost. Um, and I guess also the lower the lower capital because you you may not want to uh, sink that much capital into your um, into your engine because uh, you might need to take a loan for that so it costs more so renting it might be more cost cost efficient um, and uh, yeah it's still a high quality and safety because Rolls Royce is a, a reputed manufacturer and all the better that they make the choice to to um, to do this service model. Um, and I guess pay only for what you need is uh, is this certainty aspect, because uh, it's called power by the hour. So only if you, if you're up in the air for an hour, if it's working for an hour, that's what you pay for. Okay, so this is kind of the the run up to the to the breakout session because for me this is kind of the crux of of circular economy is this value uh, oriented thinking. So now that's um, that's what I'm going to have you all do is to think about. Uh, a value-based application. So we will, uh, in a minute, randomize you in groups of four where you can talk to each other. Um, either David will explain it in a second. Um, with the four of you, you should agree on a product or a material that you that one of you have. It needs to be something real, ideally. Otherwise, there's really no point in the exercise. Just try to agree. Don't take 10 minutes trying to agree. Just pick one as an exercise. Answer four questions about this case. Um, the four questions are, We'll quickly go through them. So the first one is, what is the product or material? And just name it, you know, wood shavings, I took as an example. Second is, what is an interesting target market? So what do you think, for whom could this be interesting? This is really already pointing to the value added. The third, the third question, which added value do you bring to this target market? So what I wrote is, mushroom growers are the target market, and these wood shavings can be a high quality and a cost competitive feedstock for growing their mushrooms. And then fourthly, will you sell it or rent it out to this uh, to client? Probably the wood shavings we will sell in this case. So these are the four basic questions that I think you need to ask for a value-oriented um, approach to circular economy. If you don't really know what is technically feasible or whatever, just assume that the technology works. Because at the end of the day, what I've noticed is that the technology is, is rarely really the, the, the limiting factor to be more circular. I'm not saying to be fully circular, but to be more circular because that's really important is to take a first step. And then, you, and then at the end, you will present us this. So you will tell us what you're gonna do. We have wood shavings from furniture making to be of value mushroom growers as a high quality feedstock for mushroom cultivation. And we think we can sell them the wood shavings at a competitive price. And there you have kind of your one liner to pitch later your boss or whatever, to tell them what you're gonna do the next year. Okay, uh, Peter David, do you want to take it? Uh, Real material that one of the companies is working with or imagined or what is, what's the idea for that? You, you cut out there for a second. What was your question? Uh, do you want them to take a real material that one of the companies is working on or working with or just imagined? Ideally, it's a real product a real or material. One. Okay. Yeah, so it can be a product that you might want to rent out or it can be a material that you might want to use in a different way. Okay. And maybe you should copy those four questions because once they go into the groups, they can't see them. So if you just copy them ah. and uh, put them, okay, now Martin already did it. Martin already did. That's very nice, Martin, because then they can see them when you go into the groups. Okay. So how many minutes? Yes, thank you, Martin. How many minutes in the groups, Winnie? Let's do uh, 10 minutes so that we stay within the time. Okay.
So yeah, you have to be fast. I will now put you into some groups and then you have about 10 minutes. Let's see. I will make nine groups, I think. Okay, and then we'll see. Um, one second, I just have to set the time. It should be 10 minutes. Okay, and here we go. So now, from now on. And Winnie, you're a co-host, so you can always go back to the main room. Ninth group doesn't work. Into group eight then. Okay.
Saleh, you had a question. You want to ask it at the end? Yes, I have a question, please. Yes, okay. Maybe better if you write it in the chat, then I can ask, uh, I can ask we need to look at it. If you open your chat and write it there. Uh, okay, I was thinking it would have been much easier to explain. Uh, okay. okay. Should I go ahead? Okay, not now, but uh, let's see. I will ask him then for if there's Q&A time at the end. Um, so just, yeah, wait a second. We're slowly returning. Yeah, people are still coming, still coming back. Let's see. I'm still missing quite a lot of people, I think. Are there only 25 returning? So I hope those who are already here enjoyed the bit uh, talk with your colleague, Circular Heroes. <laughs> yes, I think those who are returning have returned, apparently. Okay. 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 Is, um, is there anyone who wants to share what they, what they talked about, about uh, and share their sentence maybe? Um, their pitch for their boss tomorrow morning. <laughs> Okay, Ewan McEwen, yes. So um, I don't think I have a complete sentence, but uh, I got the elements of it. Um, so we worked uh, together in the breakout room and the idea we came across was uh, coconut husks. Uh, in the processing of coconuts, um, the, the, the juice and the, the flesh is used a lot, but there's a lot of waste which is left over with the husks. And it's a very uh, good quality fiber. And uh, combined with a bioresin, it can be turned into different shapes uh, without too much um, making, as it were, not too much energy, not too much cost. So one company is turning them into pallets uh, to use for shipping containers, uh, which is a a quite a, a low value item, but traditionally they're made of wood uh, or plastic, um, and it's rather a misuse of wood. Um, the good thing about the, the, the coconut husks is we were thinking maybe turn them into I-beams uh, so they can be used in, where steel or concrete is not necessary. You can use an I-beam made of coconut husk fiber. We don't know if we rent it or buy it, uh, but um, I think either model could work, but because it's quite low value, I think probably a buy is, is the option. With an option to return, maybe some kind of a deposit system. Yeah, <laughs> very, very interesting. It's nice that you mentioned also the deposit system, because that's kind of a hybrid model of, of kind of a service model that people are incentivized to bring back their, um, their materials. Cool. And then maybe a remark about the constru so a construction item to do it as a service model. I've also worked with the construction industry. It's, it's very, very promising, but also very challenging. There's like, uh, if you want to go into that, like super, super interesting, super needed, but like uh, the legal aspects are quite intense <laughs> there, both in terms of responsibility. Nobody in the construction chain wants to take responsibility. And also in terms of um, like the ownership, because, uh, not, you, won't, you won't be able to rent every part of your house, so to say. If you only rent the beams, then there, it becomes kind of um, a, a very complex web of, okay, but the beam is attached to something you do own. And then what, you know, how does that play into 
ownership or responsibility and also towards the government because you're supposed to you know ensure safety on the street so that your house doesn't fall on the street etc etc um, just as so, a side, right, um, thanks for sharing we worked with uh Yuka, Yuta, Kataka and uh, Eba on this and uh, you, you may also want to ask them to talk a bit about some of the ideas that they have with their okay <laughs> oh uh i think uh uh Iwan's well, son, uh, idea quite well uh, i don't have anything to add thank you okay <laughs> thank you uh, maybe some? we can have one more uh... yeah one more would be nice one would be nice yes anyone else From one more group. Well, if nobody else wants to go ahead, yeah, Martin. Martin. Um, so I was talking to uh, Shiro Ando mm -hmm. and um, another colleague as well, whose name I can't pronounce right now. I apologize. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about uh, Yushiro's business in beverages, like for example, producing um, whiskey. Mm -hmm and um, using those barrels. So there were already some things that were being used. For example, the barrels themselves, the wood apparently is from recycled uh, wood already. And then later on, it could be sold to furniture makers. And one of the ideas that we were talking about to like push the value higher up instead of just using the material was actually um, making these barrels themselves into furniture for bars. For example, using them as standing tables could also be for like an event service or something or making them into tables, but not just using the wood, but actually using the barrel and creating the story of the whiskey together with the, with the place where you drink it, like the bar itself, right? To, to actually, yeah, like also use the identity of the, of the product from before into the next one and perhaps making that barrel more valuable in the second use than it was in the first use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I can totally see that happening. <laughs> <laughs> and I think if I'm not completely mistaken, then there, there either were some ideas like that or it has already been done by somebody. But um, we weren't quite sure um, if this is exactly the use, like basically using the wood before for furniture, that's already done. But perhaps there's an even smarter way of using the wood for furniture, for specific furniture, where, you know, you, 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 in, you increase the value of the already made thing instead of taking it apart, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Winnie, Winnie, before we close, there was a, a question from, from a while ago from Saleh Victor, who would like to ask a question. So maybe Saleh, if you can be sharp and not too long in the question. Are you still there? Or maybe not anymore. Saleh? No. Okay. Then back to you, you again. To, uh, back to you again, Winnie. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to ask uh, on the last slide that I, I put my uh, coordinates, feel free to ask me any question. I am very uh, open to reply. So just to wrap up, my key takeaways. So this is the last uh, exercise that we did on it. Think value-based. This is really the key for something to succeed in the circular economy. Collaborate, for sure. Uh, you may not want to be both a beverage company and a furniture company. So you're going to have to uh, collaborate. Uh, that's a very silly example, but down the, in these in these more complex uh, supply chains, definitely the way forward. And then also, it's for everyone. Like, just you don't need to find a solution that's perfect. Just experiment small and cheaply, and try things out, and then scale it up. The the, the Bosch project with Papillon is a good example. They did this product as a service thing for a social impact project, but meanwhile, their multi-billion global uh, sales thing can pick up on these lessons. You know. They can see if this is interesting for for uh, for their whole business because they experimented uh, small and smartly mainly that was it um this is how you can connect with me thank you so much for your uh, attention yeah and i hope to speak to you and see your projects uh, thrive thank you so much yes thank you this was a really yeah actually it would be nice if we had another 10 minutes but that's the organizer's fault and not yours so <laughs> I think it was really interesting. Uh, I think we should all give uh, Winnie a hand and say thank you for an interesting workshop and keep up the good work. Yeah, and watch what's happening with Nellis and the Forbes platform. This will be a, an innovative platform also in this space very much. And thank you to everyone for joining your precious time, sharing your precious time with, with us here today. And uh, 
stay tuned for future webinars with NMU also. Thank you so much. And goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Winnie. Thank you so much. Thank you.